Mr. President, the United States surpassed 11 million COVID-19 cases this past weekend. This comes just six days after our nation recorded 10 million cases, 1 million added to the 10 million in six days, making it the fastest transmission of 1 million new cases since the pandemic began. Nearly a quarter of a million Americans have died. This runaway crisis is alarming, it's deadly, and it demands action. The city of Chicago began, began a stay-at-home advisory to help encourage people to contain the virus in our communities. Across Illinois, more than 5,000 patients have been hospitalized with COVID-19 each night for the past week. We have shattered new infection records nearly every day this month. Illinois has now experienced more than 597,000 cases, and we have sadly lost 10,875. My heart goes out to everyone who's lost a loved one. In addition to trying to keep ourselves and our loved ones healthy and safe from the virus, Americans have also been struggling to deal with economic uncertainty, job loss, food insecurity, child care, the list goes on and on and on. Here we are just days before Thanksgiving, and many of our neighbors are trying to pick the right day to go to the food bank so they can feed their families on this day of thanks. Where is the sense of urgency on Capitol Hill when it comes to providing another round of economic impact payments, unemployment benefits, funding for food stamps, the SNAP program? Our country is in desperate need of help, and they're counting on us. You would think that this galloping crisis would be the first order of business for the Republican-controlled Senate this week. Yet, while this pandemic continues to rage, too many Republicans in Congress refuse to even come to the table to negotiate a comprehensive bipartisan relief bill. There are those who will, and I commend them. It takes real courage. Instead, the leader, Senator McConnell, has scheduled votes this week on six barely qualified judicial nominees. The average age of this week's judicial nominee is 38. You see, these are lifetime appointments, and if you get somebody with the right answers to the political questions, and they'll give you 20 or 30 or more years, boy, you've got control of that court. And control of the court is more important, obviously than the coronavirus. The youngest one of these nominees is Catherine Mizell. She's 33 years old. The American Bar Association took a look at her record and judged her unqualified. This is the 10th Trump nominee for a lifetime appointment to the federal court has been judged unqualified by the American Bar Association. Oh, you might say, I'm sure that happens. Well, it didn't happen at all in the eight years of the Obama presidency. Not a single nominee who was judged unqualified was sent to Congress. Another nominee, Stephen Vaden, who's been nominated for the lifetime position at the Court of International Trade, has never appeared before the Court of International Trade. He's never tried a case in any court. He'll be a great judge once he figures it out. We'll also be voting on D Dr. Judy Shelton's nomination. I believe that came up earlier this afternoon to the Federal Reserve Board. She is uniquely unqualified. Her economic views are almost humorous. They are so far out of touch with reality. We're experiencing the worst recession in 75 years and Dr. Shelton, by her stated views, is unprepared to contribute to dealing with this economic crisis. It's the story of the 116th Congress. 
The Republican-controlled Senate spends month after month after month ignoring the raging pandemic and refusing to even consider the House passed relief legislation. Here's a good question for members of the Senate. How many amendments has the Senate voted on this calendar year of 2020? Not counting impeachment, let's set that aside. But how many amendments to legislation have we considered in this calendar year? The answer is 27. 27 amendments in this calendar year. That's an improvement, incidentally. 2019, we considered exactly 22 amendments. Six of them were forced on us by Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, who basically said, I won't let you go home till you vote on this amendment. And as Senator Paul said, of course, he lost every one of those amendments. 27 amendments one year, 22 the previous year. You know why? We don't legislate. We don't debate. We don't offer amendments. We don't pass bills. We come here with a new set of nominations every week from the Republican majority. We don't have any legislation on the pandemic. We have no legislation on economic recovery. We just have to get these lifetime appointees, some who've been found categorically unqualified. That's what the Senate is all about. In the past, in this last week before the Thanksgiving recess, is this really all we're going to do? How about the 28 rural hospitals in Kentucky that are facing closure? How about the $1.3 billion in uncompensated losses for these hospitals across Kentucky? The Republican proposal a few weeks ago didn't provide any economic resources for hospitals, clinics, or health care providers like those. Americans need leadership. They need for the Senate to step up and say, for goodness sakes, whatever the political agenda here, how can it be more important than this pandemic? Isn't there enough talent and will on the floor of the Senate, on the Republican side and on the Democratic side, to find a way to help Americans who are struggling, to provide unemployment assistance, to provide help to small businesses, these restaurants and other small businesses that are facing closure, to give some money to local units of government who through no fault of their own have lost revenue due to this COVID-19 crisis. These are not wild ideas. These address the very basics that face families, businesses, governments across this country. For some reason, that particular issue can't make the agenda. Mr. President, I ask the statement I'm about to make be placed in a separate part in the record. Without objection. Mr. President, losing an election hurts. I know. I lost three elections before I ever won one. I suspect that anyone who's ever lost an election has had to grapple with the disappointments, the what ifs, and even a kind of sadness bordering on anger. But that's the risk you take when you run for office. The voters have the last word. Never until now have we heard it suggested that a losing presidential candidate ought to be allowed to put America's national security at risk because he is struggling, struggling mightily to accept his own loss in the election. Never until now have we tolerated a losing presidential candidate deliberately undermining the American faith in the integrity of our electoral system. Never before have we witnessed a losing presidential candidate refuse, out of spite and anger, to follow the law and to allow the peaceful, orderly transfer of power to his successor. Never before now could many Americans even imagine an outgoing president deliberately sabotaging our nation's heroic efforts to bring an end to the deadliest health crisis in our country. But that is what is happening. It is shocking. It is dangerous. It is shameful. It needs to stop now. Some of my Republican colleagues ask, well, what harm can it do? We want to humor the president. We, he, he's going through a period of adjustment here. He lost an election. It's, it hurts. 
poor president, we've got to stick with him. We've got we to parrot his theories of how there would be massive numbers of votes discovered somewhere. And, and we know that he's raging in his tweets regularly. He still must be in pain, the poor man. And we've got to humor him. We've got to tell him, yes, Mr. President, you must be right. This, this election must have been stolen from you. Well, let me tell you what Harmon can do. Every minute of every hour, an American dies from COVID-19. Every day, a thousand Americans are dying from COVID. That's nearly a 50% increase over a month ago. We are nearing 1 million new COVID infections every week. The pandemic is surging in every single state and public health experts warn that the worst is yet to come. Over the weekend, we learned President Trump has not attended a single meeting of the White House Coronavirus Task Force in five months. He told us why. I'm tired of this COVID-19, he says. He's gone AWOL. By refusing to concede the results of the election, President Trump is preventing our federal health officials from meeting with Vice President-elect Biden's COVID Task Force and starting to coordinate the efforts for the transition that is going to take place January 20th and failing to put the time, personnel, and resources into the distribution of a vaccine, which we pray to God will be available soon. In doing this, the president is jeopardizing America's ability to successfully distribute a COVID vaccine and bring this pandemic once and for all under control. He's deepening our nation's economic crisis because the first step to healing our economy is defeating this virus. All because of the pain he's going through personally. Well, I wish I could share that pain, but I'm overwhelmed by the pain of America going through a pandemic. The president's hurt feelings don't compare. The grief of losing an election is nothing compared to the grief of 246,000 American families who've lost loved ones to this pandemic. There's the grief we ought to be concerned about. More Americans voted in these elections than ever before in history. Now that the elections are is over, the results are clear. President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris received 306 electoral votes, 232 votes for President Trump and Vice President Pence. Four years ago, the president referred to exactly the same vote totals in his favor as a landslide. Today, he refuses to acknowledge it. He is so full of himself that he can't feel the pain of others. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris received at least 5 million more votes than President Trump and Vice President Pence. That is the largest popular vote margin of victory in a presidential election since 1932. In the two weeks since the election ended, the Trump campaign and its allies have decided to strike back and file a flurry of lawsuits in six different states challenging the vote counts. Well, how are they doing? Well, these lawsuits have only affirmed the integrity of the election results that we knew. Many of the complaints have been dismissed and not a single vote has been invalidated. Even Trump campaign officials, privately and publicly, agree that none of the remaining le legal challenges can change the outcome of the election. Last Thursday, members of the Election Infrastructure Government Coordinating Council within this administration's own Department of Homeland Security called the 2020 election, quote, the most secure in American history. Over the weekend, a senior federal election official who was nominated by President Trump condemned the president's false post-election claims of vote fraud, calling them baffling, laughable, and insulting. The same official warned that, quote, these conspiracy theories that are flying around have consequences. They're dangerous for our national security. Over the weekend, John Bolton, President Trump's former national security advisor, urged Republican leaders to finally acknowledge Mr. Trump's defeat and get on with it. Another former Trump security advisor, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, rejected Mr. Trump's claim on Twitter that the presidential election was rigged. What the president says in his tweet, it's just wrong, the general said. It's regrettable. It's counterproductive.
John Kelly, once chief of staff to the same president, told Politico that a delayed transition was detrimental to the country's national security. His concerns were echoed by more than 150 former national security, senior military, and elected officials who called on the leader of the General Services Administration, Ms. Emily Murphy, to recognize the election of President Biden, President-elect Biden, and Vice President-elect Harris. But Administrator Murphy refuses to engage what is known as ascertainment to establish who the real winners were. She continues to deny President-elect Biden and his team access to resources and knowledge they need to become, to begin the massive task of setting up a new government. Administrator Murphy's actions are in defiance of the Federal Presidential Transition Act and the law that has governed the transfer of presidential power in America since 1963. Quite stunningly, what we are hearing from our American president, the leader of the free world, is the same kind of nonsense claims that petty dictators use to deny citizens democracy and the peaceful transfers of power. One need only look at Belarus at the moment for a timely comparison. America is the country that stands against these kinds of undemocratic attempts at power around the world, not a nation that cowers in fear. Leader McConnell has compared President Trump's refusal to accept the election results to the delay in determining the winner of the 2000 election. Sounds right until you look at the facts. He's wrong. The comparison is wrong. The 2000 election between President Bush and former Vice President Gore ultimately came down to a difference of not 5 million votes, but 537 votes in one state, Florida not tens of thousands of votes in many states. Even Republican attorney and elections expert Ben Ginsburg rejects the comparison. He ought to know. Ginsburg was part of the team that led President Bush's recount effort in 2000. The refusal by President Trump and some around him to accept election results is damaging faith in our elections and our democracy. The goal is clear, to undermine the legitimacy of the Biden-Harris administration even before it's sworn in. And he's damaging the ability of President-elect Biden and his team to get to work now on the deep and painful challenges we confront as a nation. People close to President Trump tell reporters off the record the president knows he can't win. Some say he just needs to very gradually come to accept the reality of his defeat. Well, with all due respect, Mr. President, your duty is to preserve the democracy. Your moral obligation is to prevent unnecessary suffering and death and to defend this country. For four years, Donald Trump, Trump has feasted on chaos and discord in America. Time and time and time again, he has placed his own self-interest over our national interest. He has damaged the institutions of our democracy and abused his power. We shouldn't be surprised by his, his destructive actions on his way out, but we shouldn't tolerate him either. It's time for Donald Trump to accept the clear results of the election and for his administration to work with President-elect Biden's team for a successful, peaceful, productive transition of power. It's time for the president's friends, allies, and political pals to finally level with the president. It's time for a confrontation, perhaps, a moment of truth, perhaps, saying to the president, it's over. Now be a man, stand up and show this nation that we can have a peaceful transition of power. Show this nation we're prepared to accept the will of the American people. Subverting faith in democracy is not a winning strategy, and it should be beneath the dignity of any American president. I yield the floor.